Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Sir Meerkat, and welcome back to the Moto Meerkat channel. So I've always been interested in abandoned places, and I watch loads of videos online from specific YouTubers that explore all these abandoned areas, because I find it crazy that just areas that were sometimes once bustling places have just been left to rot. And in the motorsport world, there are many tracks that once held prestigious events that have now just been reduced to nothing. And they've just been lost in time and completely reclaimed by the elements. So today I thought I'd do my top five favorite abandoned tracks in the United Kingdom. Um, I could do one for the whole world in future if you guys like that. Let me know down in the comments below. And I'm thinking once all this quarantine and stuff is over, I think I might travel to some tracks in the UK, some of these abandoned ones, or maybe some other ones, and do more in-depth videos videos of how the tracks are actually looking now. So again, if you'd like that, make sure to drop a like on the video and leave it in the comment section below. But without further ado, let's begin with the top five abandoned UK tracks. So we start with a track that's actually pretty local to me called Brooklands. Now Brooklands opened in 1907 and was actually the world's first purpose-built racing track. It was built by a husband and wife on their 330 acres of farmland and woodland. You have to be like, wow, that's a lot of land, but fair enough, if I had that much land, I would definitely build a racetrack as well. So the track was a banked oval, it was 30 foot high and 100 foot wide, and over three and a quarter miles long. Obviously, in those times, that they didn't really care about safety at all, so there, was, there wasn't really any catch fencing on the top or anything like that, it was uh, very, very dangerous. So Sir Henry Seagrave was the land and water speed record holder at the time and he was actually the man who established Grand Prix racing in Britain and he managed to secure the place for the race as being at Brooklands. So Brooklands hosted the inaugural British Grand Prix in 1926. Now it says on the classifications that both Robert Senechal, I hope I pronounced that right, and Louise Wagner were classified as winning. Both of them were classified as winning due to the silly car showing rules that they had in the day, which, which I won't delve into now, but goodness, it, it was really silly. And amazingly, the top three podium finishers were the only finishers of the race. Obviously, cars back then were a little bit less reliable. And it also hosted the second British Grand Prix in 1927 before it was replaced. The track was eventually closed in 1939 due to the start of World War II, and the facilities that were already there were converted for creating military aircraft and uh, just, just to help the general war effort of the UK. So due to the fact that they were building aircraft at the facility, obviously it's going to be a target for German bombings. So the track was bombed a few times and needed some serious repair after the war was over. But it was deemed unsalvageable due to the cost of repair because obviously it's a three and a quarter mile circuit, it's huge. So that meant that the track never reopened for racing after it closed in 1939 and was left to rot. But in 1987, the Brooklands Museum Trust was formed to begin to record, research, preserve and interpret all of the aspects of the site's heritage. And they've been doing so ever since, so we love a happy ending. The second track on this list is in Crystal Palace in London, and it opened in 1927. Now the track was a mile long and ran on roads that were already pre-existing and paths that went through this huge park in Crystal Palace, including an infield loop that went past the, the lake. So the bends on the track were covered in tarmac, whereas the straights were actually just hard packed gravel <laughs> until an upgrade in 1936 where they were also tarmacked over. Again due to the outbreak of war in 1939, the park was actually taken over by the Ministry of Defence, and it would not be until 1950 53, the racing would take place again at the palace. But by that time, pressure from local residents that now highly populated the area, there was an injunction which reduced motorsport racing event days to only five days a year. Part of the circuit's main claim to fame is actually being one of the key filming locations for the 1969 film, The Italian Job. And Crystal Palace Circuit also did host some Formula One races in the 1960s, albeit these were non-championship races, so they didn't really count. But around the Crystal Palace Circuit, racers were regularly achieving 100 mile an hour average lap times on the circuit, which was extremely, extremely fast of the day. So despite improvements to the course, growing concerns of driver safety as these began to ramp up during the 60s and 70s caused officials to pull the plug on the international meetings in 1972, and two years later in 1974, club meetings were also scrapped. However, some, some sort of happy ending, there are still events such as motorsport at the palace that continue to uphold the racing legacy at the Crystal Palace race circuit.
On to number three, we have Long Ridge Circuit. So this circuit was extremely short and raced on roads that had already been built. The circuit was really, really unique because it's the only one in the world to be built into a disused quarry. The disused quarry is called Tootle Heights, located on the Lancashire Moors, and it's about eight miles northeast of Preston, if you know what that is. So racing begun in 1973, and it soon attracted some, some pretty highbrow races, such as the British Rallycross Championship in 1976. Racing continued on the 0.43 mile long circuit. Yeah, you got that right. It was very, very small. So it continued until 1978 and it was so short that the maximum number of cars they could have on the track at any one time was 10. But in 1978, the site of the quarry was actually sold and this caused considerable ill feelings amongst those who'd organized sport and events in the past, both on two and four wheels, because they'd never been informed of this impending sale. They had no idea what was going on. They were busy organizing the events for 1979 and suddenly, poof, the racetrack was gone, and by 1980, the new developers had ended racing for good. The developers eventually turned it into the Beacon Fellview Holiday Park, so a bit of a crap usage for an old track, I'd say. Now for the fourth track, we have Aintree, and some of you might be thinking, Aintree? Isn't that a famous horse racing circuit? Well, yes, it is, but actually, it used to be a racetrack as well. So the horse track that we know has hosted the Grand National, one of the biggest horse racing events in the UK and in the world, really, since 1847. However, there also used to be a three-mile tarmac track that opened in 1954. The track claimed at the time to be the only purpose-built Grand Prix track, and Aintree was able to host a Grand Prix for Britain in 1955, 1957, 1959, 1961 and 1962. And it was in the inaugural event in 1955 that Sir Sterling Moss was able to achieve his first Grand Prix victory. And this went down as the first time in history that a British driver had won at a British track. The full Grand Prix circuit layout was last raced on in 1964, but the shortened 1.5 mile club circuit remained open from the mid 1960s to actually the mid 1990s. And the smaller club circuit still plays host to a handful of sprint events and some track days and stuff like that, but no proper racing like it used to. And for the fifth and final circuit, we have David Stowe Circuit. So this track was built on a World War II RAF coastal command base called RAF David Stone Moor. This base became inactive after World War II and the track was opened in 1952. So the original layout was 2.6 miles long and used the two main runways as the long straights, but the layout of the circuit was changed for 1953, adding some extra corners and made the circuit 1.9 miles long. So between 1954 and 1955, the track hosted three Formula One races and it actually saw Lotus's first ever F1 victory. And despite attracting many top British drivers, these events are actually considered to be the least known known F1 races ever held. The circuit did in fact close in 1955 after Leslie Marr set the outright lap record at the final ever event with an average speed of just under 90 miles an hour. But today the surrounding airfield is home to an ultralight and micro light flying school but no racing is being held. Well that's my top five abandoned British racetracks. If you'd like me to visit some in real life as I said earlier make sure you drop a like on the video and let me know down in the comments which ones you'd like me to visit. And also be sure to subscribe to the channel because I make motorsport related content very regularly. But that's it for today's video. I hope you did enjoy and I'll see all you meerkats later. Bye guys!